Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another great episode of Boss Babes. I'm very excited. I have my gorgeous co-host. I'm Brittany Baldy. We have Deanna Bonomo. She just got back from golfing because, of course, she loves sports. I'm rocking a great tan. I was at the Cape all weekend. Deanna, how was your weekend, girl, and how was golfing? I was also at the Cape this weekend, and I had a great time. I wish I had a time to see you. I didn't realize we were going to be so far apart. But I had such a good time. We did a little a little beer Olympics, sporty. It was so fun. It was all different sports, cornhole. We made up some of our own games, frisbee. Uh, it was a, such a blast. Uh, our good friend Elizabeth, that's whose house I was at. We had such a fun time. And then today I went golfing. Uh, I got some new set of clubs and I got to try them out. And I think it did pretty good. So I'm excited. I'm ready to get back on the green. Sounds like a great weekend. I also went to the vineyard. I know you and I were trying to meet up, but it didn't work out. But I got some ice cream, went to the vineyard. I went to Chatham. I went to Hyannis. So I just kind of like bounced around the Cape and the Islands. And the weather is still nice. So I'm excited to be back in the Boston area. And I know you and I right now are rocking our Halio Athletica. You and I are loving this brand right now. And I know you just got some great gear in the mail. What do you think about it? Oh my God, I'm already so obsessed with it. I tried it on first time and felt absolutely amazing in it. It fits great. It's silky, buttery. It's Lululemon type clothing. It is better than, with a way better pricing. You really can't beat that. And I just love it. They have a nice acronym that actually Halio stands for, which I just learned today. Um, so Halio stands for honest, authentic, loyal, integrity, and original. And that are the core values that they base this company on. And I love that it's veteran owned, which is so important to me. I love to support our vets. So honestly, I just love this company already. I'm so happy that they're going to be our new sponsor. Great company, great brand, and obviously it's athletic wear. Let's switch on over. Speaking about sports and speaking about great clothing and amazing people, I wanted to chat a little bit about Ines Cantor. You guys know I just recently did a great interview with him. Boston Celtics, Ines Cantor. Ines, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? I'm good. Thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. I'm so excited, and I know that you're celebrating Ramadan right now. How's that going? Well, actually, today is like the last day, and I'm probably having like the easiest Ramadan ever because like the past years, I probably like, usually have either practice or games or workout. So this definitely Ramadan was like the easiest that I ever had. And speaking of you celebrating Ramadan and being from Turkey, I find it very admirable that you use your platform to speak out against certain topics and controversial topics that are happening in your country. So I wanted to first start by focusing on the You Are My Hope campaign. What is, right. exactly does that mean to you? I know, and I know that you started that whole campaign yourself. Right. I mean, for those that, who doesn't know about, you know, the, the campaign, first of all, we started the campaign because of, if you look at what's happened in Turkey, there is, you know, there is no freedom. There is a freedom of speech, religion, or expression. There is no democracy, and there is no uh, sadly human rights. And Turkish uh, Turkish government using their power to abuse uh, uh, people and human rights violations. So that's why, if you look at, there is so many political prisoners and so many journalists are in the jail right now waiting for help. And uh, just because of this coronavirus thing happened, uh, Turkish government decided to let all the, you know. Uh, child rapists, you know, murderers, mafia leaders, smugglers, thieves, free, but they decided to keep pol political prisoners and journalists in the jail. So that if the virus spreads, which is already dead, in jails, there's go it's going to be deadly. So <clears throat> we started this campaign to collect uh, signatures, and with those signatures, we are going to go to White House. We are going to go to, you know, human rights court, uh, human, human rights courts. We're going to go to, you know, just... Uh, your, uh, European uh, uni, uh, Union and the United uh, Nation with those signatures, and it's going to become a conversation. Uh, there's so many, you know, athletes and celebrities already signed it, and actually they made a, a video about it. But uh, it is going to be very exciting because uh, it is going to help those all those people out there uh, who don't have a voice. So. And I saw a super cool post. You guys know that Ines Cantor has been fighting for freedom. He's a humanitarian. He always talks about human rights and giving back to his community. I saw him post yesterday that in exactly one year, he is going to be an American citizen. And that makes me so happy. Like, I'm so excited for him to be a part of another country because as you guys know, he has been literally kicked out of the country of Turkey, his home country. Dee, what do you think about Boston Celtics star and S. Cantor 
being able to call himself an American citizen within the next year. I think that's amazing. And what I love about him is that he is taking his platform to do nothing good. I have never seen, I mean, obviously, we know Tom Brady does a lot of wonderful things. Edelman, all the Patriots, the Celtics players, Marcus Smart, unbelievable. But for someone to come not from this country and want to do so much and want to be so involved in everything that's going on, I just love that about him. And I think he's a great guy. And I'm so happy for him. So congratulations. Very special guest. She's going to be joining us very shortly. Her name is Jillian Dempsey. You guys have probably heard that name. She is a big ice hockey female ice hockey star from the Massachusetts area. Again, Jillian Dempsey is going to be joining us shortly. Anna is good friends with her, so I'm going to bring her into the queue right now. Jillian, welcome. How are you? Hi, thanks for having me. I'm great. It's almost summer break starting tomorrow. Geez, it's the last day, so um, almost summer for me, but I'm, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. She is a female ice hockey star. I know we recently had on Sammy Davis, which we will touch upon that later, but Jillian is or was with the Harvard hockey team. She was a captain. She was the NWHL MVP, and she's currently the Boston Pride captain, and she's from Winthrop, Massachusetts. We are so happy to have you joining us. And Deanna, I'm gonna let you take it away. We heard, and I know Deanna has told me the story before, we wanted to, right off the jump, have a fun fact from you, and we heard through the grapevine that you were actually the one that named Blades, the Boston Bruins mascot. So let's get right into that. And then we're gonna have Deanna talk all about you guys growing up in Winthrop. Yeah, so it's crazy. Um, when I was nine years old, I named the Bruins mascot. I entered a contest and somehow mine was the winner. And, um, you know, obviously I've come across Blades in the rinks often since then. So it, you know, he actually came to one of the Pride games and it's always funny to see him because I named him. <laughs> that's just one of those fun facts that I'll throw out there here and there. But really funny that it's such a small world in, in the Boston hockey world. I feel like they'll probably never change that mascot's name. So it's no. kind of like you're leaving your mark in the hockey world, just naming him Blades. Like that, he's like a national, like everybody knows who Blades is. Right. And you know what's funny? I have actually a really fun fact to go with that. As most of you know, I was a Boston Bruins ice girl in 2015-16 season. And there was one day that I needed to, I'm sorry, I'm like cracking up because it's actually hilarious. There was one day they needed someone to fill in for the mascot. And I was the only height equivalent girl who could skate at the time. And it was at the Bruins Learn to Skate, which I definitely want to touch on a little bit because I think Joe is going to be involved in it. And then COVID happened. So I would like to hear a little bit more about that later on. But they asked me to fill in for Blades. And it was hysterical because as an ice girl, you're not supposed to talk to the players or um, you know, mingle at all. So I had to do an event with Patrice Bergeron, with Dennis Seidenberg, with Brad Marchand. And they're used to a guy, uh, my good friend Albie, being Blades. So basically they had me dress up as Blades. The hat did not fit me. The head was falling down. I have a bunch of kids jumping all over me and I couldn't speak because they didn't want anyone to know that it was a girl and it was not Blades. So <laughs> all the players are taking pictures and Dennis Seidenberg like nudges me and he's like, hey Blades, like you okay today? And everyone was like kind of punching me like Brad Marsh and gave me a little punch. And on my way out, I like made a mark and Patrice Bergeron and I think Andrew Bolesky here at the time were walking out and um, they heard me behind them basically being like, oh my God, I like, I'm so sweaty. I never want to be in that thing again. They were like, that was you. <laughs> oh, and it was just really funny. So like, you basically named me too, is what I want to tie in. <laughs> I'll never do it again. Don't ask me. <laughs> I think that's such a cute story. You never told me that story before. So I know, I just thought I'm of gonna it. love that I'm hearing this I live right now. Somewhere, I'll find it. I have a picture somewhere. And Jill, I know that you obviously are involved in the hockey world, but I also know that you love the sport of football as well. I want to hear a little bit of your take on Tom Brady, obviously now playing for the Bucks. I know we're all a little bit butthurt about that situation. <laughs> yeah, definitely. In fact, my background since the 28-3 to comeback victory has been this oh. Tom Brady. And so I now I refuse to change it. I was hoping to change it to my teammates and me with the cup, but that didn't happen due to COVID. But I'm not wanting to change that even more now because he's in a different uniform. But 
I love Tom Brady and I love the Pats. So it, it was devastating to hear that he was leaving us. And I will say it was tough to see him in, in those other colors. I mean, he looked sharp and it got me excited for, for sports, but um, it, it does hurt to see him in those colors and to know that he won't be representing the Pats anymore. But um, I still wish the best for him because like I said, I'm a huge Brady fan and he was so loyal and great to the organization for geez, what was it? 20 years or so. Um, and I love that he was the draft pick 199 and you know, it's, it's an underdog story and he's had so much success and just been such a great face of the Patriots. I'm definitely still going to watch some of his games, but I wish he was in the Patriots uniform. Yeah, I know Deanna and I have had so many talks about this, obviously, since the start of him deciding when or if he was going to come back to even play for football, which team he was going to be with. So it's definitely interesting to see him play for another team. But just like you said, Jill, I know we're all going to be supportive of him no matter what team he's playing for. Thank God he's not playing for a New York team, though, because oh I don't think I would be able to support that. It could be worse. Like, at least you have an excuse to, like, go down to Florida and, like, hang out. It's a weekend down there. I'm going to switch on over and talk all about you growing up in Winthrop. I'm going to let you and Deanna kind of just talk about <laughs> you guys growing up right in the area of Winthrop and how your family life was like and going to school together and all that great stuff. We love having homegrown people on our show. Again, guys, you are now watching a brand new episode of Boss Babes. We have co-host Deanna Marie with me, Deanna Bonomo. She was a former Boston Bruins ice girl. Um, and joining us live right now, we have Jillian Dempsey, hockey star, female hockey star. She's now currently the captain for the Boston Pride, and she also played for Harvard. You guys will hear, be hearing all about that shortly. But yeah, I'm just going to switch on over and let you two just basically talk all about growing up in the area. So I'm going to switch it over to you, Dee. All right. First of all, my question is, do you still live here? What's, what's your life like now? And then I want you to switch right into, let's talk about our life in middle school, elementary school, growing up together in Ms. Larson's class, second grade, star of the week. And then I want you to go right into, I want to hear about what rivers and like where you went to high school. Cause I know that's where you kind of switched off and you were at a great sports school, which is, I know super hard to get into. I know you have your brothers who also play sports and uh, tell me all about it. Yeah, so I'm still in Winthrop. In fact, you know, I, I, I never thought I would be back here teaching, but I am, I absolutely love it. And I, I can get more into the teaching a little bit later on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I love it in Winthrop, small town and um, right by the water. We have it, we have the best of both worlds here, you know, being by the beach and being able to get into the city so easily. And obviously just being like so close to Boston being practically from Boston and we have the best sports teams in all of the leagues and, um, you know, title town and everything. So I take so much pride in being from here, um, for so many reasons. Like you mentioned, uh, we, we go way back to the <laughs> elementary, the middle school days at Darren Pole, which doesn't exist anymore. It's crazy that they it's turned the it into apartments school. now. I know. I wish it was I wish it was still our school so we can go back and visit and just, you know, everything's kind of, frozen in that um bubble when you go back and see your old elementary school so i am i'm bummed that that's no longer a school great the memory yard. The you know, football I, yard is still there though yeah wait we the, the the play kickball and stickball yes. <laughs> we were always <laughs> out there right yeah. the playground is gone though and uh, oh, i know i fell off that slide one too many times that i'm kind of okay with it <laughs> oh, I, know. I remember we used to play that watermelon game or whatever where you come down <laughs> yeah. the tube I thinking about that now. I'm it's, I've been so claustrophobic. Like, no, and I like can't be in there anymore. Like, oh, those were good times. So I'm always playing. You know, in the back um, recess, we were always out there being being active, playing with all the boys. I, I loved that. We played uh, all kinds of ball activities out there. Recess and my mom used to make me wear a pink dress to school every day. And like Miss like Davis and and uh, Miss Omara, Miss Minnie, she used to call my mom every day. Be like I'm sorry, you know you dress your daughter so well, but she is covered in dirt. Oh and my gosh, yeah. with the boys, and I was just like, oh, here we go. This is I know my mom used to try. With the dress. We ended up. <laughs> I was like, no, nah, with the dress that you know, unless for my Holy Communion and all of the yeah. special holidays. I think we're in the same Holy Communion class too. Actually, we might have been. I think and, you know, I was doing some cleaning and organizing during this time, and I came across some um, like newspaper articles of us in the transcript from the Holy Communion. Yeah, 
Hilarious. Like a big picture of me with like a veil, and I was like, "Mom, yeah. you impress me like that." Everyone's like, "You're getting married." I was like, "I'm ten. Like, <laughs> can I live?" <laughs> oh my gosh, so true. Those were the days, though. And we, you know, we had. I, I'm so glad I can look back fondly on that because the the teachers we had. I, there was never a year that I didn't enjoy school. You know, right. we were so fortunate to have such great educators, and in the middle school. I have Mr. Mack for fifth grade and now he's actually my colleague, which is crazy. And yeah, I love my time at the middle school on the team Lions. But were you Lions though? Yeah. I, I, first fur. I think that was the only time the two of us faced off on the ice. I can't remember how it went, honestly, but <laughs> pretty sure we were both falling all over the place. We we're on our feet. So maybe we actually, will you go into telling us a little bit more about feather versus fur and how that all went down in middle school? Oh my gosh, yeah. So what was that? Seventh grade then, right? Grade, yeah. I had you were the wolves. I think I was on the Eagles. Oh, maybe I was the wolves. I, I wish I could remember. Was it kind of broom hockey? It was broom hockey, and they made us run on the ice on our sneakers and like expected us not to all like die, basically. We I have very few memories, memories of that for some reason. You would think that I would remember that so much because it was on the ice. They're all such great, you know, such great memories and um shortly after that i eighth grade was when i attended rivers in weston so it's called the Rivers school part of the isl once again i was just incredibly fortunate to have that opportunity and i absolutely loved my time there played on the varsity girls team i got to be on it as an eighth grader and um at the time it was a very new program it was our first year being varsity so it was an awesome experience to be able to help grow that program. And I think recently, I want to say that they won it all last year or the year before, which is exciting. That was something that we never achieved in my time there, but I had hoped that we would be laying the groundwork for that to happen someday. Um, and it, it's come a long way, that program, but I loved my time there and I played lacrosse, played soccer, which is so important. You know how it is. Uh, like yeah. nowadays I feel sometimes the kids specialize so early and i when we were growing up, you it's played everything. everything. And, <laughs> you played everything. Yeah, you know, you were you had different groups of teammates, and you know, you got to take a break from the sports, and right. you know, cross train and have fun playing another sport. So that was something that um, I actually continued all the way up through high school, playing multiple sports. And obviously, my my heart and my passion has been hockey the whole time. But I, I had a blast playing soccer and lacrosse too, and t ball and yeah, um, little league way back in the day. Um, team. Those were fun days too. Yeah. Well, Jill, it sounds like you played a lot of sports as a child, and obviously, growing up, you turned into a big hockey star. Before getting involved with sports, um, who are some of your biggest inspirations as a kid? Did you follow any particular sports athletes as a child? Was it like a Red Sox player, or any of the Bruins, or was it some of the female athletes? Like, can you discuss? Who are some of your biggest aspirations and how is it growing up with your family? I know that you have a sister named Megan as well. Yep. So I actually, I, I guess I didn't even touch on my family, which I should have because my family <laughs> is incredible. And I am, you know, they've been supportive in all my dreams through everything. And, you know, they're just the best. So many sacrifices. But I have an older sister, Megan. She didn't play that many sports. Like she did early on, but she wasn't into hockey the way I was. She she actually went to Harvard too. She was a senior when I was a freshman. So that was pretty special that, that we ended up getting that year together in college. And she was always at all my games at Harvard, like right there with my parents cheering me on. So that was special. And I have two younger brothers, Connor and Hunter. Both are hockey players as well. They were awesome baseball players back in the day too. My biggest inspirations for athletes when I was growing up, well, we had season tickets to the Bruins, section 324, I believe it was. And um, my dad had two tickets, so he would usually take one of the kids. He would rotate it, and whoever didn't have a conflict with our sports. Those were some great times where we would, you know, it was a great bonding time for me to be with my dad and to be at a hockey game, which is something that we both enjoyed so much. And it was kind of, you know, I guess the late 90s, early 2000s. So you had Ray Bork and he was something special, but I really love Sergei Samsonov. And, you know, he was a speedy winger, um, excellent hands, uh, great shot, and he was number 14. And I think that's why I'm so attached to number 14 and 
and why that's my number. I think it stems from Samsonov. Um, so those were some memories back in the day. Um, as I got a little bit older and was exposed to more of the women's hockey, I was a big fan of Julie Chu and Angela Ruggiero, AJ Mlexko. They all played at Harvard and were also U.S. Olympians. So to be able to sit in those stands at the Bright Landry Hockey Center and see those athletes compete at the highest level, it was something that made me feel like it was really attainable because I was able to be there and, and see them and want the same thing. So, you know, we kind of laughed because in sixth grade, I made an autobiography. It was a project and we had a future section. And for the future section, one of the big pieces that I included was that I wanted to go to Harvard and I wanted to captain the women's hockey team. And oh, wow. my parents helped me scan my, my little, you know, a face of me, um, a picture of me in the, the hockey bubble, the squirt hockey picture I had that year, and we scanned it onto one of the Harvard programs and onto one of the USA hockey programs because it was my goal to, to go to Harvard and play hockey there and to also make the Olympic team and win gold. Um, that, that didn't work out for me quite well. Um, so, But, you know, being able to attend Harvard was a dream come true for me, and I, I absolutely loved every minute of it. Other athletes growing up, I'm trying to think. Nomar Garcia Parra, like oh, that's Britney's that, favorite. That was my idol growing up. Um, and I think Troy O'Leary almost moved next door to us at one point, and I remember thinking that was so cool. He didn't, but that would have been awesome. Um, but and you know, I didn't, I didn't watch a lot of basketball. But Paul Pierce was early. It was early on in his time, and you know, we didn't watch a lot of Patriots back then either. But um, we were big Bruins fans growing up and a big time hockey family. So um, that stayed with me. Speaking of family, isn't it someone special's birthday? Yeah, my, birthday? Dad, my dad's birthday was yesterday. Yesterday. Um, yeah. and he, Happy birthday, dad. Yeah. <laughs> I was really let him know that you said so. Um, <laughs> he's honestly the best. He's been my hero. He's a firefighter. Um, now he's the commissioner of Boston Fire and, He's just the epitome of hard work, discipline, and he's been my role model forever and, and my number one fan and always coaching me and wanting the best for me. So uh, I'm really close with my dad and obviously a big day to celebrate him yesterday. And growing up with your family in the area, I know that Deanna and I love to ask questions about the family life. But how was it growing up with your family, obviously, in Winthrop? I know you kind of already touched upon it, but what was it like during the holiday season? Did you have any favorite foods that your mom or dad used to make? Kind of paint that picture for, for us, what it was like as a child growing up um, in Winthrop during the holiday season. Well, you know, I we always did the Christmas wish list. And at the top of it was always a, a yard in the rink, which... <laughs> I mean, sorry, a rink in the yard, yeah. which at the time, you know, I didn't, my dad, you know, he always, he would have wanted that for us, but we didn't have the yard for it, but it was always something that made the list. But my parents went above and beyond in always making every holiday and just every regular day, you know, so enjoyable. Like I said, when I look back on my childhood, I just think to myself that I had it great. And, um, you know, my siblings and I, we have so many memories of, uh, positive memories, just having a blast. And when we went up to Maine or Vermont, um, New Hampshire, just those kinds of trips as a family over the summer. But so much of the winter was dedicated to hockey. And um, my dad actually makes an amazing oatmeal raisin cookie. Normally, I'm not an oatmeal raisin fan, like I'm chocolate chip over anything else. But his are special. And, you know, I, I associate that the smell of those cookies with us going to tag the Christmas tree. We would go to a tree farm and tag the tree. And then we'd come back weeks later, um, maybe even months later. I, I think we used to go and tag it right after Thanksgiving. And then we'd come and we'd cut it down and uh, we would listen. I don't know if you guys remember Raffy, but that was on um, the little cassette tape and he sang Christmas songs and we would have that in the car. So that that's kind of what I think of when I, I think of my childhood around the holidays. And yeah, my dad's more of the cook, I think because of cooking in the firehouse all the time. So he makes great meals, but my mom is the most selfless and thoughtful person. She does the best wrapping um, of anything. And then I'm really close with my nunny, my grandma as well. She's actually 91. So 
Uh, and, you know, she always looked out, cared for us growing up and, um, you know, just great, great memories. But, you know, as siblings, we were pretty competitive too. We would play and the, the saying used to be, somebody's going to get hurt. And we'd be like, no, no, we're fine. And we go hard and usually somebody ended up hurt. <laughs> Um, it was always fun and, you know, you recover quickly and, and get right back at it. Like I said, really fond memories and I, I owe it all to my parents and, and my siblings for making that enjoyable growing up. It sounds like a great time and I love that your dad seems like he was the cook of the family. That is amazing. And I know that Deanna, again, you guys having so much history growing up together and you guys both being such ice hockey lovers, myself included. I'm going to flip it on over to Deanna because she's going to ask you some great questions regarding Harvard and some of your other hockey accolades. Yeah, and obviously I love to hear about the, like the hometown with them growing up. I mean, we're probably like right down the street from each other right now. <laughs> yeah, I just like, I, I love to hear it because like, I feel like we always like, do we have such similar backgrounds. Obviously we grew up in the same town, so we have a lot of the same morals, the same values growing up, community, family. So I love to hear it. I'm glad it was fun growing up. And I just wanted to switch it on over to hockey. That's what we're here for. That's what the people want to hear. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about, because I kind of like, we lost touch. We actually kind of became friends again, started talking again um, through the Bruins and the Ice Girls when you were with the Pride. And I was with the Ice Girls and we ran into each other at a Bruins game. That's kind of how we reconnected. And I know you played for plenty of other teams before that. So I wanted to touch on International Ice Hockey Federation, uh, Women's you know, National Championship, the USA team. I know you played for them. I know you played for Harvard. Um, I'm not sure the order of that. So if you want to touch on that in order, please do. I want you to paint us the picture about Harvard. Tell us all about that. Tell us about how the USA team went and making the team and what went into that. Yeah, so actually my first experience with the IIHF is, you know, making the one of the national programs was the under 18 team. And so that was my senior year in high school. And, you know, they always, every summer they have, uh, in August festival, which is like a big tryout to make the team. And um, obviously I was elated to have been selected. And in that January, so it was January of 2009, we went to the under 18 world championships and it was in Fusen, Germany. So that was, all, you know, hockey taking me all over the place. And, you know, it was, it was an amazing experience. We actually beat Canada and won the gold medal and, you know, to be standing there singing the national anthem, representing your country, wearing the gold medal with a, a close knit group of girls. It was obviously an amazing experience. And my family came and, you know, they were able to make a little trip out of it. You know, I didn't get to tag along with as many of the sightseeing things that they did, but obviously the bigger picture is hockey. And I was able to, to get what we went there for, which was the gold medal. After that, obviously graduated high school, went to Harvard. We every single season of my time at Harvard, we were we had a really strong team. So my freshman and senior years, we actually made it to the NCAA quarters and, and lost there. So, you know, I think every loss in college, especially the one that ends your season, is really devastating. You know, you put so much into it with the off ice training, the on ice training, you're incredibly close with the team and is that really um family feel to it um our, our team mantra was team first it was all about the team and you did whatever you could to contribute and to be your best self for the team and everybody really bought into that that was our culture at harvard so um you know my my goals going in were obviously to win a national championship and to win a bean pot to win ecac championship we were able to win a bean pot we did that my freshman year so it's, it's special to be part of, you know, to be a kid growing up from Boston and, and in Boston and then playing for a team that competes in the bean pot and then to actually win that historic bean pot was an enjoyable experience for sure. Unfortunately, we didn't win it after my freshman year. I was hoping we would, but, um, you know, they were always competitive tournaments every time. And like I said, that was a dream come true for me. And it was something I had always wanted and to be able to live that and experience it, it was honestly the best four years. And I look back on that and I really miss it. 
but i um, grateful for all those experiences. And I think I truly lived in the moment during that time. So you, know, you say you put it all out there and you give it your best. And at the end of the day, you can say that you did that um, regardless of, of the results. But uh, we, you know, we didn't end up winning the national championship and we didn't end up winning the ECAC championship either, which was something that was looking really favorable my senior year. So once again, like I said, I was devastating to not achieve those, but the friendships that you make and the memories and the experiences, um, you know, coming together, facing adversity and um, working towards a common goal, all of those are invaluable. And so I just absolutely loved it. My junior year in college, I was with the USA national team again. So that was, I was part of a four nations cup, which I want to say it was Sweden or Finland. One of those, because what we, there was a summer tournament where it was, I think it was in Finland, and then the Four Nations Cup, I think, was in Sweden, and um, we won the gold there, and there was another, the World Championships, we actually lost and won silver, so, but that was amazing, we, it was at UVM, and it was a packed house, and, you know, we don't experience that often in the women's game, so to see that every single seat was was taken and everybody was waving american flags it was quite the experience um and you know i had dreams of making team usa and so when i graduated college in 2013 it was the tryout in june um i was invited to the tryout for the olympic team for sochi 2014. i, I got cut and you know that's definitely up there i'm one of the the most painful things, you know, as an athlete, when you're working towards that and, and you don't achieve it, it's, it stinks. And that stayed with me, but you know, if you grow from it and you, you try to continue to do your best and be ready if there's ever another opportunity. And then there, I've had two years in the CWHL for the Boston Blades. Yeah. And then I'm going to be entering my sixth season with the Boston pride of the NWHL. So it's hard to believe that I'm now a veteran in the league. I feel like that happened quickly, but I love it. And I want to just keep on playing, keep on growing the game. You have such a long history in the sport. I think it's so incredible for a female athlete to be playing a sport like ice hockey. I wanted to have this conversation with you actually, because my boyfriend and I were just discussing it. So he obviously plays professional baseball and with a lot of, or actually all of the professional male athletes, a lot of them don't wear much protective gear, especially up around the face. So him and I were discussing you, and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna be talking to a female athlete tomorrow on my show. I wanna get her take on this. Do you know, or what is your opinion on why women are almost forced to wear completely covered up face masks? Not just in ice hockey, of course, but with softball and any collegiate level or professional level of sports, I feel like women are always more protected. Do you think it's mandated by the leagues or the sport itself? Or do you think women, because obviously we like to look cute and dress pretty, <laughs> now, we are the ones that want to be completely covered. What is your take on this? You know, it's funny that you asked that because I don't actually know. Um, I'm not sure if it's mandated, I just know it's just always been the way it has. Um, I actually, I wear a mouthpiece too, and I usually get chirped for it because not <laughs> all players do, you know, it's one of those great ones that's molded to your teeth and fits right in, but not a lot of people wear it. So I'm usually, people are joking with me about it. Yeah. I'm not sure. I, I think I was talking to somebody the other day about uh, what, what it would be like if we were wearing visors the way the men do. And I, it was just, it was hard to picture what that would be like, especially when you're going down blocking shots. You know, I'm, I, I'm thinking back to when Steven Stamkos on the Lightning, he took yeah. what I think it was a Johnny Boychuk slap shot too. It like went up, deflected off his stick right into his nose. He went down the tunnel. He came back a couple minutes later wearing a cage and his nose was black, but you know, it's playoff hockey. So that makes sense that he was back on the bench and ready to play. But Thinking back to something like that, I'm like, ooh, I don't know. You don't know if you're I don't right. know if we would you know, want to take a puck to the face. Right. Uh, we'd be willing to for the team, you know. But um, and and blocking the shots, those are great. Um, you know, good for momentum. I always love a a block shot or a great back check. But 
I haven't given that much thought to it and why we have to. I think I'm okay with wearing it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. That's a good point though. I wonder why it, the, the case is. Yeah, I was just curious about it because myself included, I played softball and field hockey and I just remember us always being fully covered up. And again, nothing wrong with it. I'm actually appreciative of it. But just thinking of like the professional baseball players, even when they're batting, all of them for the most part are completely exposed even when it comes to batting. Yes, they have a helmet on, but they're not, they're not wearing the face shield. They just, some of them have like the chin strap that comes down to protect their jawline. Um, and obviously ice hockey players, some of them don't wear the shield, some of them do, but pretty exposed. Some of them wear a mouth guard, some of them don't. So I just wanted to get your take on it. We have to find out now if it's mandated yeah. or if it's because girls just want to look cute and pretty sometimes and not look <laughs> cute. Either way, I'm glad that you guys are protected, but I just figured I'd ask that question. Moving on over back to speaking a little bit more about Harvard, how was it playing for such a top named college like literally harvard like you've been here your whole life like harvard is such a amazing school what was it like going to school there or was it like playing for the team what was it like dominating basically for that school and i believe you were also captain of that team as well correct yes yeah my senior year that was and i i truly believe that we were going to win it all obviously how it is in sports and um but we we made it pretty far and, and we had a great season I think just being at Harvard, like I said, it was a dream come true. And maybe that's cliche to say, but it really was for me. And, um, you know, seeing my my sister get accepted and then attend for three years before I attended, you know, I, I got to feel out the campus and visit her and, and just really be a part of that Harvard life. And I think one of the biggest things about attending Harvard was just soaking it all in. There were absolutely incredible educators. I, I was actually a classics major and people are usually like, oh, what's that? Or what will you do with that? But what is that? I, <laughs> <laughs> it was um, the history of Roman and, well, Roman and Greek history. And I've always, you know, I've always been such a uh, history fan. I absolutely love learning about history. And I, I love that time period as well, those early civilizations. And um, my professor was like the leading Roman historian in the world. And to think of that, it was just like being educated by the professors who are the best of the best. It was really just something that you had to take in and appreciate um, all of those opportunities. So, um, you know, being in those classrooms, in the lecture halls and in the classrooms and that section just having that educational experience was some, I, I pinched myself, you know, thinking that that was a reality for me. And the, I love the campus. I love the historic feel. And, you know, just being there, even when I go back now, I, I get nostalgic and I think of all of the wonderful memories I was able to make there and just so appreciative that that was uh, an experience that I was able to have. And, you know, the playing Harvard hockey, it it really was some it's hard to put into words because it was such a great experience and like i said we did we fell short of some of the hockey goals that i wanted to achieve but everything else i just it was the best of days you know and i would go back to them in a heartbeat and getting to represent harvard and you know like i said that team first mentality and that culture that everybody bought into i i loved it you know in the middle of july being in the weight room and just be, getting killed by our, our strength and conditioning coach to prepare for the season like those that grind and that journey is something that i i enjoy so much about sports and the harvard days it was always focused on that and ready to try to win a championship for for the program so I, you know, to wrap it all up, I just, I, I look back and I just think I'm so fortunate that that was an opportunity that I had. And I, I truly think that I lived it the, to the fullest and was able to soak it all in. And all I have to say is that those four years flew by way too quickly for me. Well, it sounds like you had an incredible time there. And you guys are listening right now to 
Julian Dempsey, guys, she's live right now with us on The Boss Babes. Joining me, co-hosting is Deanna Bonomo. You guys love her. You know who she is. Again, guys, Julian Dempsey, female ice hockey star. She was the hockey captain and star at Harvard. You just heard her talk all about her time at Harvard. Um, NWHL MVP and Boston Pride captain. This girl absolutely is dominating the ice hockey world. You guys just heard her discuss a little bit about the female ice hockey equipment. We were trying to sort of figure out why are girls more protected than the males? So we might have to have the guys come on here at some point and get their take on it. Cause I think it's kind of like an interesting topic, but we want to switch on over and discuss a little bit about your teaching. So we're going to flip that on over to Deanna and have her talk to you about your teaching and what it's like working here right in the Boston area. I honestly, I love that you're a teacher. I actually had no idea that you were a teacher here in Winthrop. So that I want to hear all about. You said you're working with Mr. Mac, rock Mr. Angelo. He was incredible. I never even had him. And I used to hide out in his classroom because I loved him so much. I was Miss Harrison, so I was next door. Um, but yeah, I want to hear all about what it's like, what your inspirations were, um, and, and what made you kind of want to do that, and how your kids are, what grade you're teaching, and and just tell me everything about that, because I want to relive middle school right now so badly. <laughs> <laughs> well, when we, it's crazy because when we were in fifth grade, it was the first year of middle school, but now fifth grade is the last year of elementary, which I think is more fitting. I, I think, uh, you know, thinking about fifth graders in the same building as eighth graders, I, I like that they get that extra year of elementary, but how I got into education and teaching, so... You know, like I said, I looked up to my sister. She was the definition of just a diligent student and she worked incredibly hard and she uh, set the path for me, set these high expectations. And so after she graduated Harvard, she joined a program called Teach for America and she was placed in Revere teaching middle school science. I think it was seventh grade that first year. and. You know, when I was gra getting close to graduating college, I wasn't entirely sure of what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to play hockey. Um, and, and luckily for me, that was an option. You know, we could still play competitively, but it couldn't be my sole job at the time. So I, I wanted to pursue another career and kind of get, get started with that. So I applied for Teach for America as well. I've always enjoyed working with kids and the little coaching that I did during my time in high school and college. Um, I, I love that experience and I've always, like I said before, I love school. So I decided to apply Teach for America, for Teach for America and I got placed in Lawrence. So I actually did two years of teaching second grade at a school in Lawrence, Massachusetts. And talk about learning something new every day. Uh, you know, you were really just you know, we had a six week intensive program where it was basically teaching one on one, but so much of teaching I discovered was what you did through the teaching process. It wasn't like, oh, here's a book, learn about teaching. Oh, you'll be great. It was you had to be in the classroom and you had to experience it and learn it that way. So those first two years were insane learning experience for me. Um, you know, I, I knew very little about the teaching profession. I, I learned what I learned in the summer, but I didn't really have that classroom experience. So I, I got that in that first couple of years. And um, I, I really miss those, my little seven and eight year olds teaching second grade was like the learn to read age. And, um, you know, they, they got super excited about pajama day and things like that. So, uh, but Teach for America is a two year commitment. And when that two years was nearing the end, I, I wanted to try to find something closer to home. And like, as luck would have it, there was a spot that opened up in Winthrop for fifth grade. And, you know, I, I was really looking for second grade or lower elementary because I enjoyed it and I liked that age group, but everything I heard about fifth grade, people loved teaching. So I was like, I'm gonna go for it. And I, I got it and I just completed Geez, was that my fourth? I just completed my fourth year here at Winthrop teaching fifth grade. I'm at the Arthur T. Cummings School. And, you know, Miss 
like you said, Rock, Mr. M, he's still yeah. there. He teaches with me, Miss Morrow. You might remember Miss Morrow. She's still there. Yeah, I love her too. Like Mr. Mac is fourth grade. Miss Grayson is still there. Yeah. Um, so there's, you know, obviously Winthrop is the kind of place where people grow up and, and they stay here and they love it here. And so yeah. I, so much of our school is about that community feel. And I absolutely love my colleagues. We just had our last staff Zoom meeting today to, you know, end the school year because obviously everything got so strange with this remote learning. And yeah. on, you know, on the fly, we, nobody was prepared for this. And it's, it's so sad for the students. You know, I feel really bad that they had to graduate fifth grade in this way, but we did a little motorcade for them last week. And it was really, you know, it got, I got the chills. I got a little teary at times as they drove by in their cars and, you know, we were applauding and waving and that was kind of their moving on ceremony, the best that we could do under these circumstances. But I, uh, you know, I love teaching and I so appreciate that I kind of am getting to do two things that I love. I teach and I play hockey and I'm passionate about both of those. And they rarely have conflicts. So I, I kind of get to do everything that I enjoy. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm fortunate because of that. Deanna and I love that you are teaching on your free time because here on Boss Babes, and I know we're going to talk about it a little later in the show, all about charity, but the fact that you're giving back to the community your own personal community that you grew up in. It's like full circle, grow up in Winthrop, go to college in the area, play for teams locally, grow up watching your local Boston sports teams. And here you are teaching, it sounds like, at the same school that you went to school at. So I think that is super incredible that you are focusing on not only evolving yourself and your own spiritual soul, but helping young kids develop and grow. And I think that is such a sweet momentum that you are continuing to go through and being able to find that time to give back. And I know you lightly touched upon it, you juggling back and forth between ice hockey and being a teacher. What was it like or how is it currently, because obviously you still teach and play professional ice hockey. Talk to us about the Boston Pride. We haven't even talked about that yet. Jump right on in. You were MVP, I believe, a few times and you are the captain of this team. Discuss the Boston Pride, what it was like on draft day, and what it's like just being a professional ice hockey player as a female. Yeah, well, like I said, it's crazy that now I'm one of the veterans. You know, I feel like being a rookie in pro hockey was just yesterday, and then here I am technically about to go into my eighth pro season, which is just crazy thinking back. Um, but when the NWHL – had its inaugural season there. I don't, I don't even think there was a draft. It was, you know, we just signed up, had tryouts and um, were, were selected for the team. And that inaugural season, we won the Isabel cup. And so that was the 2015. And it was, uh, you know, obviously the end goal every single time is to win the championship and to end your season on a win and with the trophy. So, we got to experience that in the first season and, you know, something really special that year. And you guys might be familiar with her story, but Denna Lang, who is one of my childhood teammates, we played for a program called Asbit Valley. And since we were U 12s um, and then she went to Princeton. So we were opponents in college, but then we were back together with the blades and then had that season with the pride. But um, at that winter classic uh, that they had at, it was Gillette. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, she suffered a spinal cord injury and she just, you know, she's so inspirational. She's always positive. She's working every single day to get better, but um, she's one of my great friends and winning that season with everything that she had gone through was even more special for us to be able to share that cup with her and to celebrate in, in that. But yeah, you know, we haven't won since year two, we were a big time favorite. You know, I'm talking about, I think it was the 07 Patriots. And um, then we lost in the final. I think that that year for them was 2007. So it was a huge upset. And that was a bummer. And that's, you know, that still stays with me because I haven't won it since. And this year we had a really awesome group on and off the ice, excellent chemistry, just 
great personalities and people who had the right attitude. They, you know, 100% effort, show up to the ring positive, excited to be there, to put in the work. And we had a really successful season. And we were gearing up, ready to go for our Isabel Cup final. That was going to be on the night of Friday, March 13th in Boston at the Warrior Arena. And we found out on that Wednesday night, um, the 11th, that it needed to be postponed. That's when all of the leagues started postponing because of COVID. So that, you know, there was some hope that we would we would be able to play, but obviously things that were beyond anybody's control with with the pandemic made, made that situation um, very unlikely to happen. So they actually canceled it. It's tough that that's how this season had to end with no Isabel Cup champion being named and, you know, obviously we know the success that we had this year, but it would have been the cherry on top to win the cup and, and to have that memory and that celebration. But now even more, we're hungrier than ever to get into it next year and build off what we had this season and um, to, to end the season with the cup. Like we, we want it. We wanted it several months ago and we want it all the more now. So we are hungry to, to take home that cup. So all the other teams better watch out for you guys then because next year you guys are going to be coming in hot. And I'm so glad you brought up the Denna Lang situation. And uh, that was actually my year as an ice girl. So I was actually at that Winter Classic working it. Uh, so I remember it like verbatim. And you guys made history that that day, you know. So it was just kind of sad to see it end like that. But, um, you know, I'm glad that she's staying positive And she's such a good friend of yours. So it's great to hear that from you. Can you tell me a little bit about this? NWHL MVP award because it looked to me like it was pretty huge and I know we kind of just touched upon it but if you want to dive into it a little more on how that happened and, and you know what the qualities were that took to do that and then I just want to talk about maybe what your teammates would describe you as because obviously you've been named captain of this team you were named captain of your Harvard hockey team you are a leader and if you could just say any qualities that your teammates would probably describe you as, I would love to hear about that. The MVP. So it was, there were actually co-MVPs this season. Um, a player on the Minnesota team, Allie Thunstrom, she blazing speed. And I think, I want to say she scored like 23 goals. She was fine in the back of the net, like crazy. So um, she really deserved it as well. So it was kind of cool that we were able to have co-MVPs. You know, like I said, it was a successful season and trained so much in the off season. That's, you know, there's this one quote that I love. Well, I'm, I'm a huge quotes person and everybody who knows me knows that I'm always dropping some kind of quotes. But I love the one that says a champion is made in the off season because it's those hours and the effort and the time and the dedication that is behind the scenes that goes into preparing and training for the season where the real edge in, is gained. And so for me, every time a season ends, um, you know, if I won as a champion, then I'm psyched and I want to do it again. So I'm fired up to get back into training and working towards repeating. But unfortunately, the past, geez, four seasons now, it's ended on a loss and that feeling stays with you. And it's the motivation and the fuel in the summer to get back at it and to really make sure that you're doing the extra and trying to go above and beyond so that when that season comes and it's an overtime game or it's um, late in the third period that you are ready to go and to perform at your best. So that's kind of like that my mentality that I try to maintain in the off season and throughout the season. Um, like I said, I, I love that idea of embracing the grind and training. I enjoy it. So, um, you know, every day isn't easy, but I do love training and getting better. So having that mindset definitely helps, but we had a successful season and so much, you know, my line mates uh, were incredible and the passes they made and the plays they made and our roster top to bottom, just everybody was putting in the work. So for us to have that success and, you know, obviously it worked out great for us to a certain point. Um, and it went well for me too, but most importantly, it was about the team and, you know, how they would describe me. Well, I mean, they know how passionate I am about hockey. And um, like I said, the, you know, I'll say quotes all the time, legs feed the wolf and just Herb Brooks getting in there from the 1980 U.S. Olympic team. Um, 
And I'm just, I think they know how much I enjoy being at the rink and how much I care about the team. And, um, you know, I like, I like to think that they consider me tenacious and battling in the corners, but for me, it's such an honor to be named captain and to know that my teammates look to me for leadership role. And I wear that with so much pride. I wear the C with so much pride because I, I know I represent my teammates and I do my best to lead by example and to, you know, lift up my teammates and to no matter what, put the team first. And that's just what I'm, I try to do every single day, day in and day out, because I know work ethic isn't something you turn on and off. It's something that's just consistently on huge asset to, to my game all these years and to who I am. And I think just having that passion and, Loving the grind and wanting to put in the work is is how I would define myself as an athlete and I guess in other areas of life too. And I, I would think my teammates agree, but it's tough to be asked, you know, what do they think of me? But yeah. like I said, I'm just proud to to be able to lead them and to know that they see me in that role and um, I'm eager to get right back at it with them. Well, we know that you are a leader both on and off the ice, as you have just mentioned, and Deanna has lightly touched upon. Um, you've spoke about being a teacher, of course, and we want to talk a little bit about your charity involvement and how you give back. We know that you have a very busy life. How is your charity involvement and giving back within the community? I know that recently one of our other boss babes, Emmeline Reed, she's another co-host and she actually helped found this brand with me. She recently did a really cool story with Whitman Mass, owner of Fashion Fun Pop. She worked with Ariel, and they are doing a program right now called Nominate Her. Please go and visit their Instagram. Again, it's Fashion Fun Pop. They're located right in Whitman Mass. So I'm very excited that women are coming together, being boss babes and giving back. But Jill, let's talk about you and how you give back to the community. I know in your free time, sometimes you like to get involved with camps and a little bit of coaching when you can. And I know that you were supposed to do a learned escape program with the Boston Bruins. That's sort of on hold right now because of COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, so much of what we try to do as the Boston Pride organization and very much um, values of the NWHL is connecting with the community. And as you both know, the Boston sports community is massive and passionate and loyal. And so we really want to connect with them and, um, you know, have them in the stands at our games and something that we do after every single home game, which I think is so critical in, in forming those relationships and that connection with the community and with the fans is that we sign autographs after every single game. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a line wrapped all the way around and we get to take a second to say, hey, thanks for coming or like, you know, love your jersey. And, you know, we just get to connect with the fans. And that's something that is unique to the women's game right now, I would say. I know that the um, NHL has opportunities like that as well, but it's something that we make a big point of doing every game because we know how important it is to have those fans and to have them come to our games and to support us. And especially those young fans, the little girls in the stands, we want them to grow up and have these amazing opportunities and to have the game be more developed and grown for when they're old enough to play in it so that they can enjoy it as well. And so being that role models and peers and um, role models and pioneers for the younger generation is something that we take very seriously. And so anytime we can connect with them, that's something we want to do. Like you did mention, we were going to be part of the learn to play program with the Boston Bruins. We are partnered with them so that we were going to be able to help some of these girls like suit up and skate for the first time. And um, it, we had so many sessions planned for the spring, but obviously with everything, it was disrupted and had to be canceled or postponed. Um, we're not sure yet, but hopefully we'll have the opportunity to get on the ice with those young girls sometime soon. But um, Things are very busy between teaching and playing, but when I do have the time to coach and you know help out with skill sessions or do some camps, I try to be involved with those. Obviously, so much of 
what we're trying to build for the future is for these young players. And even like some of the young boy hockey players, they come to our games and, you know, I have boy hockey players in my class and the girl hockey players as well. And it's just, you know, trying to build something better for them and all of the, you know, getting to see us do what we love and give back to the community and connect with them is something that is, is so important. So, so much of what I do in my role as a teacher and as a hockey player trying to grow the game is connect with these younger kids and try to be a role model and um, try to help them grow and, and dream big and know that work ethic is incredibly important and putting in that effort and sacrifice and, uh, you know, we're just trying to make it better for them. Well, Jill, it sounds like you are a great staple right here in the Boston area. We are so happy to have you on the show with us and also being a part of the Boston community. You guys are now listening to Jillian Dempsey, again, ice hockey female star, playing currently for the Boston Pride. She also was a star athlete at Harvard. She's a teacher, you name it, she has done it. Where can people find you on social media? We're gonna talk a little bit, a little bit about where people can find you on social media. That way, if you have any upcoming charity events or for games, and then Deanna's gonna wrap it up with some positive pop for the night. Yeah, um, I'm, at, I'm not great at social media. I get on there here and there, um, but it, it's pretty simple name it's just jillian t dempsey i think that's my instagram and twitter so um those are really the only social media outlets that i use but um i'll you know i'll do posts for big games or anything exciting um but definitely give my my hockey team a follow as well i believe it's just the boston pride or at the boston pride and at NWHL and also just a shout out to my my friends over at Prove People Wrong. That's a, a mindset and a model that I think they started their company back in 2010 and it was just, you know, they had people telling them they weren't going to make it far in hockey and their mindset was prove people wrong and continue to go out there and work. So they have awesome gear. They just relaunched and um, give them a follow too because they're awesome and that mentality is awesome. Prove people wrong. That is some great positive pop. Amazing. Deanna, what is your positive pop for the night? So I love that. I love to hear that. Jill, you've been such an inspiration on and off the ice. I've always, you know, looked up to you since we were kids in second grade. And I just think, like, I just love everything you've had to say tonight. So I appreciate you being on the show. And to wrap it up, I just wanted to tap into a little positive pop. And this weekend was actually a huge feat for the LGBTQ uh, community. And we always love to see, you know, the legislative legislation coming together and actually doing something right by the, by the community, Boston community, the world community. And they actually made it illegal to not be able to fire any transgender, gay, bisexual, any LGBTQ person for any reason relating to that, um, which I think is awesome. I mean, I'm just surprised it, it wasn't a right a long time ago, LGBTQ people are all human, just like all of us. So we're really happy to hear this that everyone else is seeing that too. And that's some great positive pop. Thank you guys for all listening to the Boss Babes tonight. We are gonna have another episode coming up soon, but Jillian, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You are so incredible. You are so impactful to the Boston community. Cannot wait to see the upcoming season. Deanna, great co-hosting per usual. You guys rock. Please continue to be positive. Follow Boss Babes on social media. We hope to see you all soon. Thank you, Jill. Thank you guys so much for having me. What a great time.